This week, we have too much material to cover. That could probably said, be said for most of the weeks that we're doing this, but this week there's a particular embarrassment of riches. So on the final slide of today's lecture, I am going to list other sources that are particularly useful that you might want to have a look at. Our focus is on Matthew Tyndall, who died in 1733. He published his key contribution to the Deist controversy only at the end of his life, when he was over 70 years old. But he had not been a stranger to controversy in the meantime. In 1706, he wrote a book called The Rights of the Christian Church, and many people took this to be a defense of Erastianism, which was the position that the civil authority, the state, had supreme authority over the church. In turn, that meant that the bishops of the church were without any civil authority except such as the government would grant to them. So that was an unpopular work. It was taken by some, including the uh, Bishop of London, to be an attempt to promote atheism and infidelity. In 1730, stung perhaps by a pastoral letter from the Bishop of London, Tyndall lashed out with a couple of works culminating in his longest and most uh, formidable work, Christianity as Old as the Creation. As with many of these deistical works, the title sounds like perhaps it might be a defense of something fair, but when you get into the details, it looks like a direct assault on the grounds of revealed religion, both Old and New Testaments. And uh, he does this under the guise of promoting the religion of nature and saying that Christianity is really just the religion of nature, but of course that's Christianity with all the supernatural bits removed. So that book, Christianity as Old as the Creation, is the focus for the works that we're going to be discussing today. It is sometimes called the Deist's Bible because more than any other work published in this controversy, Tyndall's Christianity as Old as the Creation rakes together everything that can be said on the deist side against Christianity and piles it all up in one place. The book is written as a dialogue, and it wanders somewhat. It does not have a systematic thread of exposition. So I'm going to try to reduce it under a number of heads, and then I'm going to pay particular attention to a few of those, and you can chase down the others in your reading if you like. Tyndall says that it's evident by the light of nature that there is a God, or, in other words, a being absolutely perfect and infinitely happy in himself, who is the source of all other beings. Of course, many Orthodox Christians might claim as much. The one phrase that's a little bit odd in his definition is the bit about God's being infinitely happy in himself. But it's there for a reason. What Tyndall wants to do is to latch onto that bit of his definition and argue that if God is happy in himself, then no laws that he promotes for his creatures can be promoted for his sake. He, after all, doesn't even need his own creation. So they must be for the good of his creatures. God being unchangeable and perfect, nothing can proceed from him but what is perfect, and therefore his law must be, like himself, unchangeable and perfect. But that means that the original religion, which is propounded for man's happiness, that being the only possible purpose for it, must be unchangeable. And then it follows that nothing can be added to it, particularly nothing can be added to it by a later revelation. All of the page references to Tyndall I am giving here to the second edition from 1732. Now we come to the particular assault on Christianity, and although, as I said, the work is kind of scattered and these thoughts are distributed through it in no very systematic fashion. I think we can pull out half a dozen or seven, perhaps, key strands of it. First of all, the evidences of Christianity, particularly the evidence for miracles, have no force. We'll see why he thinks that a little bit later. Second, we cannot depend on the transmission of a written revelation. Tyndall is one of the people who makes prominent the telephone game objection to the transmission of ancient texts. It was copied by someone who copied a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, and in the chain of copying, it is all but inevitable that much of the sense must have been lost and that there must be great difficulties now in our even telling what was originally written. However, insofar as we can, the Christian scriptures are obscure. 
and they are fit only to perplex the unlearned reader. That, of course, cannot answer to the ideal of a revelation which, extended to everyone, ensures that all men equally know what their duty is to God. So if there's anything difficult, perplexing, uh, troubling, requiring learning, then the great mass of people cannot have any way of knowing what was originally intended. You will recognize here a line of argument that we have from Herbert and from Blount coming up again in Tyndall, a common refrain. Insofar as we have them at all, they tend to give readers unworthy conceptions of God and of their own duty to God. He goes into quite a number of passages attempting to prove this. They command or approve of things that are apt to lead men astray. Again, a common charge, especially the uh, morality of the Old Testament is assailed here, and this gives rise to what William Paley will later, later call the attempt uh, on the part of infidelity to wound Christianity through the sides of Judaism. In other words, if we can attack Judaism and in the course of that actually get at Christianity, well then all the better. Uh, the Old Testament is inconsistent with the New Testament, a little uh, Marcionite flavor coming in there where the New Testament God of love and the Old Testament God of vengeance are pitted against one another. And finally, the Christian revelation should have been universal, if it were true, and universal in two senses. First, it should have been equally available to all men at all times everywhere. But in that case, it can't have been a revelation unless it was a revelation committed to all men at the beginning and then retained, uncorrupted, and perfect for all men to know in all places, in all times, in all cultures. Second, if it really were universally available, then it should be universally believed. But it's not universally believed. We all know that there are people who don't believe it. The inference is pretty easy to draw that if it's not universal in these senses, and if these premises are correct about its being universal if it were true, then it's not true. Tyndall does not draw that conclusion, but he comes as close to it as he can without actually stating it outright. Here is a quotation from Tyndall, from the middle, page 169 of the second edition. They only answer the end for which their reason was given them, who judge of the will of God by the reasonableness and goodness of doctrines, and think his laws, like his works, carry in them the marks of divinity. And they, likewise, do the greatest honor to the scripture, who suppose it deals with men as with rational creatures, and therefore admit not of any of its doctrines without a strict examination. And those who take a contrary method would, if they lived in Turkey, embrace Mohammedanism and believe in the Al-Quran. If that line of thought sounds familiar, then perhaps you've been reading some modern writers like Richard Dawkins. If you were born in Arkansas and you think Christianity is true and Islam false, knowing full well that you would think the opposite if you had been born in Afghanistan, you are the victim of childhood indoctrination. Same point from an atheist rather than from a deist, but the same basic argument. I've always thought this an odd argument. Suppose that we were to replace Christianity with something else. Oh, I don't know, the germ theory of disease. And suppose we were to find some place where it was true, whatever this means, that if you were born there, you would not have believed in the germ theory of disease because you would have been raised by people who didn't know of it or who had their own theory of disease incompatible with it. Would that make you the victim of childhood indoctrination? Just a very odd kind of saying by Dawkins. But there it is, it's quite common, and you will see it uh, abundantly in the contemporary atheist literature. So Tyndall's thought had some reach, and his work being a sort of clearinghouse of deist arguments, whether he was the first person to think of this, he was certainly a person through whom it was widely disseminated. Well, if we can't uh, judge of things except by their internal evidence, is that enough? He says, yes, it is. Would not Christians themselves think it a sufficient proof of a religion's not coming from God if it wanted any of those internal marks by which the truth of religion is to be tried, 
without inquiring into its miracles or any other its external proofs, and consequently, wherever these internal marks are found, are not external marks needless? Think about what he is saying here, because it's a bolder claim than it looks at first. At first, reading just the first query, the first sentence, it would seem that he is saying that the absence of these marks suffices to disqualify something as a revelation from God. In other words, the presence or absence of the marks is useful as a negative test. Lacking these, it can't be. So the presence of the marks is a necessary condition for it to be a revelation. But then comes the word consequently. And after that, he's applying the doctrine of the internal marks as if it were also a sufficient condition. So there's a slide here, a, a basic inversion of a conditional statement. If it has the marks, it is a true revelation. Coming from, if it's a true revelation, it has the marks. So the marks are being treated as both necessary and sufficient, though in his first sentence, all that he's asked is whether we would grant that they are necessary. We'll see that some of his critics, uh, and in particular Butler, will come up against this and hammer him hard on this point. Tyndall confronts his readers with a dilemma. I see no middle, he says, but that we must either own that there are such internal marks fixed on every part of the true religion as will enable the bulk of mankind to distinguish it from all false religions, or else that all traditionary religions are upon a level, since those who in every country are hired to maintain them will not fail to assert they have all external marks, such as uninterrupted traditions, incontested miracles, confessions of adversaries, number of proselytes, agreement among themselves, and all those other external arguments that the Papists and Mahometans set so high a value on. Notice here a couple of things that Tyndall is doing. First of all, he counts on his Protestant audience to be very ready to accept any criticism that is brought in as an attack upon the Catholics, the Roman Catholics, the Papists. Second, he's playing the same game with Islam, expecting that his readers will be only too happy to make any accusation they can against Islam. Then he's saying, your only escape from being in the same boat is to allow that the internal evidence of the doctrines themselves is both necessary and sufficient for you to approve them as true. But if the internal evidence is both necessary and sufficient, then the suggestion is we have no need of any revelation. What can it do? Merely remind us of the truth. If God sent down as the 11th commandment the fact that 1 plus 1 equals 2, this would do nothing for us, because we already know that 1 plus 1 equals 2. And so, he thinks, for all of the principles of true natural religion. What follows, then? Why sincerity must be the key to the proper worship of God. Must not men of all religions whatever, if equally sincere, have the same title to be equally favored by God, who is the only infallible judge of their sincerity and the use of those talents, whether great or small, he has endowed them with? So now it's all a matter of the internal evidence, and as we look at the doctrines and try to see whether they seem to us to be good, right, true, noble, and we do our best to see that, that is all that God can require. As you can see, immediately the entire structure of Christianity as a revealed religion, telling us things we could not have ascertained simply by thinking about it, or would not have ascertained simply by thinking about it, is undermined. Sincerity is all there is to it. Well, why not the appeal to miracles? Why are miracles useless? Here's what Tyndall says. For tis vain... It is in vain to have recourse to miracles if evil as well as good beings had the power of doing them. And some are so heterodox as to imagine one reason why evil beings are permitted to do miracles is lest from the report of miracles, which is alike spread everywhere and for every religion, 
men might be tempted not to rely on the reason and nature of things, and so run into endless superstitions. And God in the Old Testament is said to suffer miracles to be done by false prophets in order to prove his people. And in the New, such miracles as would, if it were possible, deceive the very elect. So you'll recognize Deuteronomy 13 and Matthew 24 being appealed to there. It was, he goes on, a proverbial saying among the philosophers of Greece, thamata morois, miracles for fools, and reasons for wise men. The Boeotians were remarkable for their stupidity and the number of their oracles, and if you look no farther than the Christian world, you will find that ignorance and the belief of daily miracles go hand in hand, and that there is nothing too absurd for the people's belief. Keep this in mind as you're reading Hume at the end of the course. In part two of his essay of miracles, his third objection has to do with ignorance and barbarous countries and the fact, as Hume thinks, that reported miracles are far more common there and far more easily believed than they are in the refined, educated, enlightened world. That is to say, the world of Hume and a few of his friends. Where did Tyndall get this idea that miracles would be useless if none, if anyone other than God could work them? Well, it turns out he got it from an Anglican bishop. William Fleetwood, who was a fascinating fellow, um, first person ever to construct a price index tracking the value of money over six centuries, he wrote in 1701 an essay on miracles, and Fleetwood's teaching there does appear to be, although I haven't seen anyone actually draw the connecting dots here, it's pretty obvious, um, the source for what Tyndall is saying. Here's what Fleetwood tells us. A miracle can be worked only by God or by one to whom God has delegated the power. That would be an instrument of God, since the course of nature being settled by divine power can be unsettled by no less. So, Tyndall, I think, is getting this from Fleetwood. I, I guess I'll put this down as a possible pattern match, but I think a really secure one. So, if somebody wants to chase that down and be the first person to say it in print, perhaps you can be. Um, but Fleetwood argues, if anyone but God or his instruments could work a miracle, then miracles would be useless as signs. Here's how he puts it. There could indeed be no use made of miracles if anyone but God could work them independently of him and at their pleasure. They could not manifest a divine power if any less could work them, nor could they attest to anyone's being sent of God if any other than God could exercise such power, because they might proceed from one as well as the other. You could not know that I came from and was sent by such a prince by my bringing his seal along with me, if other people had the same seal and would lend it to others to use as they saw fit. This metaphor of someone coming carrying a message from a prince or a king, and the message bears his seal, is one that's quite important in discussions of how we are to know whether a revelation is really sent from God or is a mere invention of someone else. And the miracles were supposed to be the seal of it, but if others than God can work miracles, then it would appear that we're left in the dark regarding whether a given miracle is worked by God or by someone else. So, as you can see, Fleetwood supplied the raw material for the critique that Tyndall was going to mount. If you've read Leland in uh, letter number nine of his view of the principal deistical writers, you know that there are many excellent responses to Tyndall's work. John Connie Bear is just one of those people who responded. He was the rector of Exeter College when he wrote it, but was almost immediately transferred to become Dean of Christ Church in Oxford, and then later he was made Bishop of Bristol. In 1732, he wrote a defense of revealed religion, and it was a pretty thorough response to Tyndall. It is also a pretty fat book, and I have no time to go through every part of it, so I'm just going to hit a few highlights of Connie Bear here. The law of nature, he says, is not perfect or perfectly understood. 
It can be no perfect, more perfect than the human reason of those who understand it, and we are all very imperfect understanders of the law of nature. This whole argument that what proceeds from a perfect and unchanging being must itself be perfect and unchanging strikes many of Tyndall's critics as being really specious. Um, it sounds good only on a first hearing, and then you begin to ask, uh, if I proceeded from God, must I be perfect as well? I'm clearly not. Something is wrong with the line of reasoning. The law of nature is not unchanging because there are matters of high importance that can be discovered or known with confidence and clearness only by revelation. For example, assurance that there's pardon for our sins upon repentance, or the comfort of hoping for the aids of the Holy Spirit in doing things that are otherwise too difficult for us. These things, Connie Bear says, we could not have discovered by sitting back and doing philosophy. It was a revelation or nothing for these things, and therefore it's just not at all proper to say that revelation is useless or that revelation can give us only what we could have known already without it. Tyndall objects to the gradualness of Christian revelation, but Connie Bear rejoins that some things would not be received if they were delivered at one time, but they might be admitted at another time after due preparation made for them. Of course, this recalls the biblical phrase, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. In the fullness of time, when things were ready for it, not when it would not have been received in the way that it needed to be, but only when it would. So, a very characteristic Christian response to this kind of charge. How about the charge about universality? The fact that Christian revelation is not everywhere received is no argument against its truth, since, as Conniver puts it, no force of proof, no, not demonstration itself, can prevail with everyone. Men may shut their eyes and refuse to consider, and they will be disposed to do so, where irregular passions shall render the truths to be proved unacceptable. A revelation, therefore, however strong the evidence of it may be, may be rejected. This cannot be otherwise, so long as human freedom remains, so long as God deals with men as rational creatures, and does not force proof upon them, whether they are willing to admit it or no. This theme that God desires that people will come to him by the exercise of their own faculties is going to be picked up and developed in Butler's analogy of religion. In fact, Butler is going to be the consummate developer of this line of reasoning. So keep Connie Bear in mind as you read Butler, and remember that Connie Bear published before Butler did, although there's a whole lot in Butler that really can't be attributed to anyone else as well. The gentleman, he says, hath here expressed a great contempt of miracles. Miracles, says he, for fools. Which words, though cited from some of the Greek philosophers, he makes his own by the application. And if we demand what reason he alleges for this proceeding, the answer is, weak men are frequently imposed on, and apt to take those things for miracles which are only cheats. But what then? Must this pass for a reason? And can there be no real miracles? Because some men will be apt to credit feigned ones? Connie Bear doesn't use it here, but there's an analogy that caught on and was used very widely later on. And that's the analogy of real and counterfeit coin. There are people who counterfeit money. They strike their own coin that isn't actually the authorized coin of the realm. Does the fact that counterfeit money exists mean that there's no such thing as true money? Well, no. Obviously it does not. And so, a line of argument is developed, building on this metaphor, saying, what would happen if we were to test various claims to be true revelation the way that we would test something that looks like a gold piece? If it's just iron pyrites and I drop some sulfuric acid on it, it'll dissolve. If it's gold, the acid will roll off and do, do it no harm. So. The objective here is not lazily to reject all reported miracles with one wave of the hand, but rather to say, all right, let's come up with due tests, and then let's apply those tests. That'll help us to sort the wheat from the chaff, as it were. Help sort the real coin from the counterfeit. So those who responded to Tyndall 
taking up Connie Bear's line, I often like to use that metaphor. You will see that cropping up probably in some of your readings as they come up here. Another person who responded was James Foster. Uh, Foster was a Baptist minister, unorthodox in his view of the Trinity. He had read Samuel Clark's work on the Trinity, the Scripture Doctrine of the Trinity. Clark was a subordinationist, and I haven't done enough research on this to see whether Foster followed him there, but I know that he was influenced by Clark, so that may be where he was coming from. Still, he was a highly respected preacher and writer, and he even got an honorary doctorate from a Scottish university. Um, Alexander Pope writes of him that he is uh, extolling his virtue as a preacher. In 1731, the year after Tyndall's work, he responded with the usefulness, truth, and excellency of the Christian revelations. This is a systematic uh, work. Here's one of the things that he says as a response to Tyndall. On the contrary, it is as plain that notwithstanding their rational faculties, men may be ignorant of some great and essential branches of morality. For reason can only be serviceable to us in directing our moral conduct if it be cultivated and improved. And even self-evident truths may be unknown if they are not considered and attended to. And much more the principles of natural religion, of which the utmost that can be said is that they are capable of strict demonstrative proof, but are not knowable by intuition. So take the existence of God. It is not in the sense in which people in this era used the term an intuitive truth, one the meaning of which cannot be understood without also the one understanding its meaning, seeing that it must be a truth. Some people, like Samuel Clark, produce very elaborate arguments demonstrating the existence of a first cause, for example. But just because those arguments were elaborate and difficult, they could, at the very most, be claimed to be demonstrative arguments, not to be intuitive truths. You could understand the claim that a God exists, a first cause exists, and not, in virtue of understanding it, see whether it must be true. So even if it could be demonstrated, it wasn't intuitive. And since it's not intuitive, people are capable of thinking it, considering it, without immediately seeing that it must be true. And some people, at that point, will turn away from the prospect of a rational investigation. So for that reason alone, we could not, should not expect, even that if all men are rational, they will equally have knowledge of great and essential truths. Here's another quotation from Foster. Florid declamations upon the sufficiency of human reason are certainly of very little weight against the general observation of mankind, an undoubted matter of fact. Now, tis unquestionably true in fact, whatever the cause of it be, that there is nothing the bulk of mankind are more averse to than serious thought and consideration, and nothing in which we are more likely to be disappointed than if we expect from them that they will set themselves to examine and reason clearly and distinctly, even upon subjects of greatest moment. So Foster is quite pessimistic about the idea that we can discover all the things that we knew to do, need to know in order to do our duty toward God just by reasoning. How could we discover those things just by reasoning? Would we really look around, see what people could discover by reason that they don't? Is there any reason to treat this, the matter of revelation, any differently, even if it were discoverable by reason? Foster will go on and argue that, of course, there is much that is not discoverable by, by reason alone. He says many of the same things that Connie Bear says in that respect. A lot of the criticisms that Tyndall makes of particular scripture passages remind me of something George Horne wrote in his Letters on Infidelity. Horne is a writer from a little bit later, and we're not going to be reading him, but this particular quotation I thought was an apt summary for much that Tyndall and others have alleged against scripture. Pertness and ignorance may I ask a question in three lines which it will cost learning and ingenuity thirty pages to answer. When this is done, the same question shall be triumphantly asked again the next year, as if nothing had ever been written upon the subject. And as people in general, for one reason or another, like short objections better than long answers, 
In this mode of disputation, if it can be styled such, the odds must ever be against us, and we must be content with those for our friends who have honesty and erudition, candor and patience, to study both sides of the question. Be it so. I mentioned that I was going to give you a sort of short list for further reading. Um, Barclay's Alcafron deals with many different DSC deals with Shaftesbury in parts, he deals with Mandeville in parts, but the sixth dialogue seems to me to be directed at the kinds of things that Tyndall in particular was saying, and since Alcafron was published in 1632, the time was certainly right for Barclay to be reacting, among others, to Tyndall. So again, here's a possible pattern match. I commend that to you if you're interested in tracking that down. There are papers waiting to be written by people who have verified the matches in these patterns and are able to find enough parallels in the language of Barclay's Dias in his dialogue to make a positive identification. Simon Brown's Defense of the Religion of Nature and the Christian Revelation is an important uh, work, not terribly long, um, Edmund Gibson's three pastoral letters, in particular the second pastoral letter seems to me to be directed fairly clearly at Tyndall's ideas, so if you want to take a look at that second pastoral letter, that's another place to go for a relatively short piece of work um, in ordinary printing in, in the um, Rithingham edition. I think it's going to come out as only uh, 60 pages or so for the second letter. Uh, so you might want to check that out. Um, John Jackson and Leland. Leland did two volumes. He seems to excel at writing long works. And Henry Stebbing all have written responses. Sorry, that should be uh, 1730. I'm not sure why I forgot to erase the one in there. Leland says 1731, but Stebbing's actually 1730 for the first printing. 